Italy is definitely famous for its beautiful city, Venice. It is such a colorful and exotic city today that always crowded with people and famous for its good tourism. As a city also embraces diversity, Shakespeare put Venice as a setting for his two famous work, Othello and the Merchant of Venice. Venice is the perfect matching place for these exotic tragic figures, other else would definitely not let those minorities freely act. Venice's situation was way more tolerant than England's. Moore could become a respected general and Jew a rich moneylender. Like today's American dream for everyone, if one does really hardly work, Venice seemed to be a heaven for anyone who would have dreamed of equality and living in a harmony. However, it doesn't seem that Shakespeare drew Venice as a totally happy place when thinking of endings of both figures. Shakespeare, in final, did lead them to a tragic fate, not overcoming their foreignness, by telling us that Venice is not, in fact, a dream world. Nevertheless, I'd like to argue that Shakespeare did just project back then English site, not Venice one, toward with work. In fact, Shakespeare projected England's insights toward Jews in this work, not rightly capturing the Venice atmosphere. Moreover, including many incidents, that famous pounded flash scene thus says it all. In the beginning section, I'd like to argue why Shakespeare had chosen Venice as a setting for his two foreign figures. London was a successful international trade back in the day. Not only Jews, but also Blacks, French, Dutch, Italians, Spaniards, Portuguese were there, comprising 4 or 5% of London's population in the late 16th century. As they were not an original English, they were officially referred to as aliens, or more typically as strangers. Sir Edward Coke would we'll call an alien as one born in a strange country under the obedience of a strange prince or country. Obviously, those minorities couldn't well get along in 16th century England, as shown in the case of the Evil May Day, in which apprentices attacked foreign residents in London. Londoners' local xenophobia is also shown in Andrew Pettigrew's notings. He says, in the spring of 1551, a time of particular tension and rumbling discontent, a deputation of citizens made a formal complaint to the Lord Mayor against the strangers, and a plot to attack the foreigners was nipped in the bud by the city authorities. Being put about that there were 40 or 50,000 strangers in London, absurd exaggeration. Shapiro notes that since London's population at this time was somewhere between 70 and 90,000, this rumor is quite remarkable for what it reveals about Londoners' fears of being overwhelmed by strangers. Londoners trying to control alien population would be continued. On March 1st, 1593, a bill for the control of merchant strangers was introduced into Parliament. Queen Elizabeth commanded the Lord Mayor to instruct the elder men to make with as great secrecy as may be, diligent search, within all parts within your ward, what and how many foreigners are residing and remaining within the same of one nation, profession, trade or occupation, every of them are all. Enact first Scene the third, when Shylock is seeing Antonio. Shakespeare tries to show what would have been Jews in her sight, expressing his grievance being a Jew, but also is getting an unjust treatment from Christians because of Jews' deaf skills. How like a fawning publican he looks. I hate him for he is a Christian, but more for that in low simplicity, he lends out money, gratis, and brings down the rate of usance here with us in Venice.
If I can catch him once upon the hip, I will feed fat the ancient grudge I bear him. He hates our sacred nation, and he rails. Even there, where merchants most do congregate, on me, my bargains, and my well-won thrift, which he calls interest. Cursed be my tribe if I forgive him. Shapiro notes that it was the economic strength of resident aliens, not usury, that was making Londoners increasingly nervous about their own financial well-being. So getting hatred because of their deaf skills seemed to be undoubtedly true. Stripe asserts that English were fearing that their artisans and mechanical persons might be impoverished by the great multitude of strangers being of their trades and faculties. Also because there were many rich men among them that lived austerely to benefit themselves by usury and exchange of money without doing any good to the commonwealth. Shylock's hatred to get along with Christians seem to be also historically true. Though they be demised or born here amongst us, yet they keep themselves severed from us in church, government, and trade, language, and marriage. Jews don't have to care for the Christians, nor have to be generous. John Wally argued that anti-alien legislation would harm the city. This bill should be ill for London, for the riches and renown of the city come by entertaining strangers and giving liberty unto them. Antwerp and Venice could never have been so rich and famous but by entertaining of strangers, and by that means have gained all the intercourse of the world. His opinions are akin to those not long after expressed in The Merchant of Venice about the freedom of the city accorded Venice alien population. Shapiro knows that it was no secret to Elizabethan legislators, especially those with any first or second hand information about the economy of Antwerp or Venice, that Jews figured prominently in international trade. Even Edward de Mock, who had advocated closer surveillance of the aliens, noted that in Venice any stranger may buy, sell, or purchase house or lands and dispose thereof by his will, or otherwise at his pleasure as freely as any citizen. And this we may do then in some sort. Antonio, being a Venice citizen, knowing better than anyone else that Venice is a commercial city that has indeed succeeded in bringing together in one place more different types of men than any other city, who is waiting his fate, says calmly to Salarino that he is prepared to pay to bloody creditor, knowing that Jews are the foundation of the city's prosperity. The Duke cannot deny the course of law, for the commodity that strangers have with us in Venice, if it be denied, will much impeach the justice of his state, since that the trade and profit of the city consists of all nations. So Venice stood as a model for an ideal economic coexistence between subjects and aliens, which was indeed impossible in London. However, Shakespeare seems to be in a failure to overcome the English side toward to Jews, especially in Portia's absurd judgment toward to Shylock. Shakespeare is being illogical with what Antonio has been said. An alien Shylock in final couldn't overcome the social tensions in London in the mid 1590s, when faced to the famous trial in Act 4, 
where Porsche's observed defense that Shylock's spawn does not specify a jot of blood. Being ridiculous and nonsensical, it leads Shylock to respond as, Is that the law? Terry a little, there is something else. This bond doth give thee here no jot of blood. The words expressly are a pound of flesh. Take then thy bond, take thou thy pound of flesh. But in the cutting in, if thou dost shed one drop of Christian blood, thy lands and goods are, by the laws of Venice, confiscate unto the state of Venice. Well, since flesh contains blood, of course, that it is also Shylock's, unless he tries to take more. And why should she mention Christian in Venice, where everyone is welcomed? Her saying that is even discrimination, where even-mindedness is most needed. Everything is just being illogical and imaginary. Continuing her illogical ruling, Shylock now even can't get his principal. Portia even warns him that thou shalt have nothing but for future to be so taken at thy peril, Jew. Dumbfounded, Shylock's words are, Why, then the devil give him good of it. I'll stay no longer question. However, being ill-natured in this trial, she doesn't stop there. And her threat in here are also the ones that show Shakespeare's limit to draw the work as objectively as one can be. Terry Jew, the law hath yet another hold on you. It is enacted in the laws of Venice. If it be proved against an alien that by direct or indirect attempts, he seek the life of any citizen, the party gains the which he doth contrive, shall seize one half his goods. The other half comes to the private coffer of the state and the offender's life flies in the mercy of the Jew only, against all other voice. So this is where Shakespeare's English hatred towards the Jew reaches its peak. As Antonio above has said it, Venetian society guarantees equality before the law, a feature that has attracted foreigners to Venice. It retains legislation that renders this equality provisional if not fictional. Thus, Portia's fantasy judgment is just a projection of English hatred toward Jews, rather than the one which would have happened in the Venetian Republic. The fact that Shylock is a Jew doesn't make him punished in Venetian society. However, the speech, starting as a Jew, ends as an alien, three lines later. Such a trick to make a Jew a threatening alien Shylock is punished not because he's a Jew, but because he's an alien. Shapiro well states that Merchant of Venice is not about a community's attack upon an alien, but the conviction of an alien on the grounds that he violated a pre-existing law against citizens. The Merchant of Venice is easy to arouse anti-Semitism. While in reality, contrary things happened. Shakespeare didn't write a real Venice, but an imaginary Venetian state. Although Shakespeare is applauded today as an unparalleled genius, it was his limit to not overcoming contemporary opinions. Even Belmont is an imaginary state where only love and happiness happen. Only left people, which bears reality, are Shylock and Antonio, who both have lost money and their loved ones. Thus, trial's judgment didn't bring a solution for everyone. This play should be reevaluated again, at least not as a comedy.